In Psalms 138, reading in verse 2 this evening, we're going to finish our series that we've actually started in January. We said we'd do 12 messages on the King James Bible. Tonight we're going to be considering reasons for believing the King James Bible. And this is just kind of a conclusion to the 12-month series. And uh, I committed to it, and I think I told you this morning, I got along about June, July, and I said, I've said enough about this. And But each month, I said, no, no, I'm going to finish it because I said that. Because of that song, by the way, this morning. I said, I've got to, I've got to finish what I committed to. And uh, so here we are in, in our last message, Reasons for Believing the King James Bible. And these are just a few. We started off in January, the Holy Scripture then revelation, inspiration, preservation, then the importance of the King James Bible, the deity of Christ in the King James Bible, objections to the King James Bible, the King James Bible and the NIV, traditional text in the King James Bible, the canon of Scriptures in the King James Bible, the translators in the King James Bible, the Apocrypha in the King James Bible, and then we did one kind of a general message titled The Symbols of Scripture or The Symbols of the Bible. And that was last month. I'm going to be quoting from some other authors here tonight, and, and I'll try to tell you when I do, I like to give credit, but sometimes I get in and out of quotes and, and fail to do that. And there's many men that I know across our country can do a lot better job than I can in discussing this subject that we've done this year, but I hope that we've, uh, it's been a help, you know, to us to hang on to this book here. And you need to just give it a hug from time to time and tell God you love it. You love His Word because um, uh, we do celebrate 400 years with this English Bible. We come here this evening reading in Psalms 138 in verse 2, and He said, I will worship toward Thy holy temple and praise Thy name for Thy loving kindness and for Thy truth. For Thou hast magnified Thy Word above all Thy name. Lord, again... We praise You and thank You. And Lord, we uh, just uh, bless Your holy name tonight. We ask this evening that Your anointing and blessing again would be upon the reading of Scripture. Lord, speak to us uh, from Thy Word and by Thy Holy Spirit. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Three simple things I'll bring to you this evening. And uh, we've spoken on each of these in the past, in one not in one message, but at uh, different times. And first of all, I want to speak to you about the language of the King James Bible. Simply its beauty, its plainness, its preciseness, its purity. And when we consider uh, the English language, as English became more universal, a more universal language, I guess I should say, God gave us this book. And the English today is spoken and understood by over one billion people, even though it is the mother tongue of only about one-third of them. And it has been the world's second language. It has become the world's language of uh, diplomacy, communication, trade, and entertainment. And um, and so, as we come here, I want to read this passage. I'm just going to go through some passages again tonight. We've covered some of those in the past that deal with the, the Scripture themselves. But notice the latter part of verse 2 before we turn to Psalms 12. And he said, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. As God places great importance upon His word, you and I are to do the same. Turn to Psalms 12. Now, in the English language, there's over a half a million words, I believe, uh, that are... Oh, now, you think about this. Over 500,000 words that, that are common to the English language. German language has about 185,000, and the French language has about 100,000. So it is a rich language. I gave you a little handout here uh, a few months ago uh, that speak particularly uh, in reference to the English uh, language. There's over 5,000 languages and dialects in the world. And God has preserved 
to you and I for the last 400 years His perfect Word in the English language. Now notice as we read in two verses here, again, I'm just going to go through some verses. We're talking about, first of all, the language of the King James Bible. And we see here in verse uh, 7 and verse, uh, verse 6 and 7, rather, I want you to see that God has preserved His Word and His Word is pure. He said, For the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. In chapter 11, reading in verse 3. Now, the linguistic scholar A.T. Robertson, uh, he said this concerning the King James Bible. He said, No one today speaks the English of the authorized version or ever did for that matter. For though like Shakespeare, it is the pure Anglo-Saxon, yet unlike Shakespeare, it reproduces uh, to um, a remarkable extent the spirit and language of the Bible. Another quote from someone else said, The authorized version consolidated an English of its own, and its language actually became the standard. Now think about that. It somewhat created an English of its own, and its, and, and its language actually became the standard. It goes on to say, And it was itself the well of the Anglo-Saxon tongue, pure and undefiled, it was translated into a level of English that was able to bridge the kings and his subjects. It is a Bible for all people. It did not come from the upper level or the lower level, but the middle level. That's where we're at. And so it is a, it is a, a Bible, again, that did bridge the kings and the subjects. It is a Bible that any can read if they desire to. One writer said in the 1611, it was the very best English period in the English language to produce a standard English Bible. And that is very true as you study uh, Old English and um, Middle English and Modern English. Modern English began somewhere around the 1500s. And um, one writer also said the English became standardized during the reign of Queen Elizabeth and King James and it said that was between 1558 and 1625. That was about 70 years, and it achieved great richness and vitality during its time. I mean, English just was, um, you know, at the top during this time. And another writer said this, and he said, Previous generations educated the people up to the Bible, for the Bible should not sound like the morning newspaper. It is God's eternal and holy Word. And we must learn Bible language and not dumb it down. I mean, any trade that you would go to in this country, uh, and we've got some here, some people sitting here in different trades, represents different trades. There is a language for those trades. And uh, you don't have people going in and saying, we've got to change the language of that so I can be a part of that. And the thing about it with the Bible, we've just got to learn. And there's, there's material available. We've had stuff in the library that will give definitions of words. I forget some of the definitions of the words, you know, in, in this, in this book. And I have to go back and look at them sometime because I just don't think about them that often. And they are words in here that we, that we have to go back to that we may not use, uh, today. But we don't want to change the Bible. It is a rich, uh, you know, the truths that are in it are rich, and then the English that is in it is amazing. In Psalms 11 and verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Turn to Psalms 119 and notice here. Now, we're still talking about the language, and uh, Psalms 119, I'm going to read just two or three verses, and then we're going to turn to chapter 23. Now notice here in Psalms 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. Tremendous statement. 140 says, says, Thy Word is very pure, therefore Thy servant loveth it. Another wonderful statement. And then in verse 160, 
He says here, thy word, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. This whole chapter is dealing with the Word of God. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 23. Still, still talking about language. Uh, notice in Psalms 23. Now here's some interesting things. And I'll be in and out of quotes. I'm, uh, three or four different authors I've quoted from already. But in Psalms 23, of the 119 words in this psalm, only 24 are more than two syllables and only five are three. Now the point is, the King James Bible, and I've heard different age grades and whatever, but we know for sure that the King James Bible is written on between an eighth and tenth grade level. I've heard six and I've heard seven, but without a doubt, between the eighth and tenth grade level. God has given us a book that we can understand, that we can read, and that we can love. Now, the King James Bible has a small vocabulary. It, now, think about this. It uses simple words. Most are only one or two syllables. Now, I realize there's some names that I still struggle with in here. Justin and I were talking about this last night. And uh, we understand that. But most of the words in this book are simple words, and most are only one or two syllables. The average Bible word is barely over four letters. Now, you, you think about that this evening. Now, in the Hebrew Old Testament, there are 5,642 words. In the Greek New Testament, there's around 4,800 words. In the King James, and, I, and I've never added these up. I'm taking other men's word on this now. I haven't taken the time to add this up. One says six, the other says eight, but still, it's a small number. In the King James Bible, there are, I'm just going to use 8,000 different words. Now, you think about that. That's one-third of Shakespeare's vocabulary. He used between 15,000 and 21,000 English words. Some say 21,000. And so the King James would be between six and 8,000 different words. The simplicity of this, of this book. They are, and I'm going to read here in Psalms in just a moment, but there are 319 words in all the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And 250 of these are one syllable, and 60 are of two syllables or over. We're talking about the simplicity, the language of the King James Bible. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and 6-7 is 82% of all the words are one syllable. See, God's gave, given this book to all manner of people, and all levels of education. You'll notice in Psalms now, and we're going to be reading here, and then we're going to turn to Psalms 8. He says Psalms here in Psalms 23. Now, let's just read it. You know it. You can quote it. You can sing it. But as I read this, think about this. Of the 119 words in the Psalm, only 24 are more than two syllables, and only five are three. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Still my favorite psalm. And, uh, and it's just, it's a simple written psalm. So that the saint of God can glean from it and understand it and be blessed by it. Turn to Psalms. Notice with me in chapter 8 now. In the book of Psalms in chapter 8, we're still talking about language. 
In Psalms chapter 8, let me read the first three verses. Now, the simplicity of the King James Bible, the language of the King James Bible, the beauty that we find in it, and we have a message we did a few years ago, wrote an article on it over 20 years ago, over 25 years ago, on the these and thous. And I'll just come back to them just for a moment and emphasize the beauty of the King James Bible. Um, many today love to sing, How Great Thou Art. Do we not love to sing that? And at the same time, criticize the King James Bible for the these and thous. And, uh, and they love to quote Shakespeare today. And we'll turn around at the same time and criticize the King James Bible for its language. Now, the use of the these and thous in prayer is more than a simple matter of reverence and respect. It is a matter of grammar and doctrine. And I'm not saying that you have to use them every time you get down and, and pray and whatever, but it has to do with doctrine and grammar as well as reverence and respect. Because you'll find that when you come to the Scripture, you'll find that the Lord is never referred to as, hey, you. He's, we find that He's given respect and reverence, but also the doctrinal issue and, and the grammar is important. And as we come to the King James Bible, it preserves the distinction between the singular and the plural uh, pronouns. And again, you've heard me say this before, the singular, the thee, thou, thine, and thine, is referring to one person in this book. Now, I've never went to every one of them, but I've went to many of them. And you may say there may be exception to the rule. If there is, and the rule is is that the T's are singular. And the ye, you, your, and yours is plural. And if you just pay attention, this you'll see that. I'll give you an example of this. And I'm not going to turn to this passage. But in Luke chapter 22, verses 14, and then verse 30, I'm sorry, verse 28, through verse 35, the Lord is in the upper room with His disciples. And he addresses his disciples. He referred to them as you or ye. And then he turns and addresses Peter only. And he said, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He turns and speaks to Peter only. And it's in the singular. And we can know that. Um, we might know it possibly anyway, but we can definitely know when he's addressing the twelve. And then he addresses Peter if you read all of those verses I gave you, he'll come right back and then start addressing the twelve again. See? And, 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 and this is the only Bible translation, you know, that, that is available to us that I know of that, you know, still... Let me just put it like this. Nearly all of the modern translations since 1881 destroy this distinction. Now, you'll notice with me that as we come here to this passage, I'm just going to read the first three verses, a great psalm. And I want you to notice that as we read this, he says in verse 1, he said, O Lord, our Lord. Now, please notice the, the thee and thy. He said, How excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordain strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. Yeah, this is reverence and respect, but it's also grammar and doctrine. And we find here in Psalms 8, verses 1, 2, and 3, this is referring to deity. It's referring to our God. Our Creator, and how many gods do we worship? One God. He's in the singular. And here, verse 1 again, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth, who has set Thy glory above the heavens. Now turn with me please back to Psalms 23 one more time. And notice something else here. 
Now, number two this evening, the honesty of the King James Bible. The honesty. And when I say the honesty, I'm going to be talking about uh, a couple of things. First of all, the italicized words. And we've spent some time on this uh, in the past. Now, we could, we could go back and say that the King James holds to the original Hebrew and Greek text, and it does. It's honest in that. Uh, we could, we may say something about the copyright on it in just a moment, the royal copyright, but it can be copied. The honesty. We could talk about the translators. They reveal their purpose in the dedicatory as how they feel about why this Bible was produced and it wasn't for money. Okay? It was for the people. It was for the church. It was for God. And now, the honesty of the King James Bible, we see in the italicized words. And you say, what is all that about? Well, when they had to add a word, the translators, it's italicized. I don't know of another translation that that is true, especially since 18 and 81, since the revised version. Now, why is this so important? Before I read here, I'm going to give you three other verses that you can check out. But why is this so important? Well, the King James is the most honest translation, for example, the NIV, the New International Version. We'll use that because it's very modern. But the NIV and other modern translations add words in the same type. All translators, by the way, add words. But they add it in the same type. Type and you don't know that it's been added by the translators. Now, italicized words were added to make sense to the English reader. No version is a word-for-word -word translation from the Hebrew and Greek for such a translation would not make sense in the English. Now, I'm quoting, Now, words are added to complete the sentence structure of the new language, to bring clarity to the new language. Do I believe God has preserved His inspired Word and we have it here? Yes. Do I believe the italicized Word should be in our English? Yes. I wouldn't dare, you know, uh, mess with any of that. I believe exactly they're supposed to be there. We've heard of families the last few years saying don't read the italicized Word, skip over them. That's ludicrous. This is God's Word. And I believe God led this to be done. See, it is virtually impossible to translate a Greek participle, that is one word, with one English word. And I'm going to, I'll give you an example of this. In John 1.8, the words, was sent, is added by the translators. John was sent to bear witness. Now, you could read the verse, but this brings clarity to the verse. In 2 Samuel 21.19, the brother of is added. By omitting that, by omitting these italicized words, the brother of, you would think it would be saying that someone else killed Goliath. And then in Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, the word word is added. Deuteronomy 8.3. And it's added to complete the sentence. Anyone can see that this word should be there, which the word which proceeded from the mouth of God. And when the Lord Jesus Christ quotes from the passage, when He quotes from that in Matthew 4 and verse 4, He chooses to put a word for the italicized word in the King James Bible that we have in the King James Bible. He uses the word word. You know. So, so, don't ever doubt any of these things that you have in this book. This is God's Word. It's been tested, and you know, uh, over the years, 400 years, and honest translators, I'm not saying they were perfect, but they're honest translators, and again, you go from one language to the next, sentences must make sense. Now, notice with me, in Psalms 23, and I'm going to be reading from verse 1 again. Psalms 23 and verse 1, look at this. The Lord is my shepherd, 
I shall not want. The word is there is added and it's an account. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. No harm done to the text. It brings clarity to the text. It's not like the modern versions that change the text. Now turn to, to, to the New Testament and notice with me in 1 Thessalonians and reading in chapter 2. Now another thought in talking about the honesty of the King James Bible is the copyright. It does have a royal copyright. Second Timothy 2.9, the Word of God is not bound, but it is free. Now the NIV has a commercial copyright, and you can't copy over 200 words from it. I mean, that's the limits. And it is owned by Rupert Murdoch, the same man that owns the copyrights to The Simpsons and the Fox Network. I believe he still owns this. But the King James Bible was produced and owned and copyrighted by the Crown of England. And the British government still licensed all printing of the text in Great Britain. It can be printed outside of Great Britain. Listen to this. The King James Bible has been published without restriction in America from its beginning in the 1700s. No restriction. You can take and copy this book. Now, you can't copy the marginal notes out of some of the, you know, the published and whatever, but you can copy the King James Bible. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Now, let's come not only to the copyright, let's consider the, uh, the revisions. How many times have you ever heard that your Bible that you hold in your hand has been revised thousands or hundreds of times? How many have ever been told that? And it's not, don't even resemble the one in 1611. All right, now, I've had an original copy, a duplicate of the 1611 for 29 years. And our brother here, what was it, earlier this year? You bought every one of us that very thick uh, copy, and I appreciate that. And, uh, and so you have a replica of the original 1611. And if you wanted to... I don't have the time to spend six months, you know, going word for word. Now, I've done a little bit of that in the past, but you can go and check this. And I want to talk to you about some of those revisions. Uh, let me, before I read here in Thessalonians, let me just go ahead and, and give you a few thoughts on this. Now, there's some good material. I have books and pamphlets in my library that men have spent hundreds of hours searching this. The Bergen Society and different ones have just literally spent much time working on this aspect. And uh, there's people like uh, Brother David Cloud and different ones that's done a lot of work, you know, in this area right here. And of course, he quotes a lot of other authors that's done work. But talking about the revisions. The King James Bible was updated in 1613, 1639. The one that we actually hold in our hand right now is the 17 and 69 edition. Now, when you think about this, all of the changes. Now, you, we're not talking about other translations and modern translations and, you know, and destroying truth from the Hebrew and Greek to the English and then on and on the story goes. You're talking about, um, this Bible that went through a strenuous purification process and can be trusted today. Now, here are some of the changes. I'm just going to give you a few. Here's some of the changes. And by the way, all the changes were very minor. Anytime you have printing, you can have printing errors. And the changes were very minor. They were uh, spelling updates. I'm going to give you an example of that. Footnotes and marginal references, you know, updates and correction made in that. But these are basically minor changes. I'll give it, for instance, let's go to the printing aspect. The typeset used in the original 1611 was the Gothic typeset. The typeset we are reading today is the Roman type. Now, all you gotta do, every one of you, every one of us has a replica of the 1611. So you'd go home tonight, lay it out, 
and turn to First Thessalonians or any passage and then lay your, you know, your King James that you have now beside it and you can see they're the same except for maybe spelling and things like that. The Gothic V looks like a Roman U. And the Gothic U looks like a Roman V. These are some of the changes now. And the J looks like an I. Let me give you an example. Love, L-O-V-E, in our Bible. Well, before, in the original, it was spelled L-O-U-E. Same word, same truth, it's just a matter of spelling. Us, U-S, was originally spelled V-S. Again, between the Gothic um, you know, type style and the Roman type style. Uh, the word uh, joy, remember I said J looks like an I? The word joy, J-O-Y, originally was I-O-Y. Same word, same truth. Same meaning, same definition. So there were some of the issues with printing. Nothing major, nothing changed in your Bible. Uh, Brother Dr. Wade, he's, he has done extensive studies you know, on this. And I'm, I'm talking about extensive studies if you want to get some of his material. Now, spelling. Now, here's some of the spelling corrections between the original 1611 and the current Bible that you and I hold in our hand. Alright? The word fear, F-E-A-R. It's spelled then, F-E-A-R-E. Dark, D-A-R-K. It was spelled then, D-A-R-K-E. That's not complicated. It's not changing thing. It's not hurting anything. Uh, textual, uh, eras. In 16, the original 1611 and the current, and I didn't write the verses down for this, but one passage says, Seek good, and the current says, Seek God. One says, Thy crown, the crown, rather, and ours says, Thy crown. One says, Returned, and the other one says, Turn. See, we're not talking about major doctrinal changes, you know, in, in the updates you know, in the King James Bible, over 400 years. Still going to teach the same doctrine, basically say the same thing. Now let's come to our third point this evening, the accuracy. Let me go ahead and read here uh, in this passage. And I'm going to be reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. This, if this calls also, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The Thessalonian church received the, their words as the Word of God, and not as the words of men. And when we pick up this book today, and that's been tested by time and every other way, we can honestly say that this is the Word of God. God is speaking to us tonight as we read verses from this book. Turn with me to Second Peter. I'll be reading in chapter 3. Now, the third and last thing this evening, and I could go a lot farther in this, I could spend a whole sermon just on the corrections in the different uh, years were that it was updated. But the third and last thing is the accuracy of the King James Bible. Now, the critics will tell you and I that the King James Bible, uh, that there's contradictions, that there is discrepancies, and that there's problems throughout its pages. How many have ever been told that there's contradictions in the Bible? Now, there, you'll occasionally run across somebody that will go and take you to a passage that is difficult. The majority of people that tell you there's contradictions in the Bible, if you'll ask them to show you one, they usually can't. They usually cannot do that. Supposedly, and I've got some books in my office, and, and we've wrote one article on this um, area, but supposedly there are over three, let me see, 
3,100 problems that scholars have found in the Bible dealing with names and dealing with dates and dealing with ages. Now, I've had some of these presented to me. And what I want to do tonight is just take you to just a few and say, look here, if there's an answer for these few, there's probably an answer for the 3,100 that they say they found. Now, I've studied probably 50 discrepancies so far, supposed discrepancy, and there are no discrepancies. The Christian Research Foundation, I read this years ago, offered $1,000 reward for anyone who could find a scientific error in the Bible. And the foundation was set up by the late Harry Rimmer, and was taken, he was taken to court and tried on eight accounts the plaintiff was thrown out by an unsaved judge eight times in a row. He never had to pay the $1,000. Now, what is the real problems as we come to this? And people say, well, it's not errors. Brother, you were just telling me this morning or last night, somebody you know, that uh, can claim salvation and at the same time cannot believe the creation story in Genesis chapter 1. And you'll be amazed at the people who say, uh, I believe, you know, uh, the Bible is still yet, there's no way that such and such could happen. There's no way there could have been a universal flood. There's no way that there's six days of creation only, you know. And there's no, there's no way, um, there's no way that, um, um, a big fish could have swallowed a man in several, several, you know, People say, I believe it, but I have a problem with this right here. Well, some of the problems that people have are from not taking God at His Word. Or maybe they're lost. Or maybe there's a superficial reading of the Bible. How many times have you ever read things and read it and you scratch your head and you say, God, I just don't understand this. Somewhere down the way He gives you and, you know, a little nugget on that says right here it is. And you say, wow, I've never seen that before. Sometimes they're, they're not comparing uh, Scripture with Scripture. Sometimes they're not rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Sometimes they're uh, listening to uh, man's opinion. Sometimes they're not uh, praying and waiting for answers from God. Just go ahead and brush it off and say there's a mistake. Now, he says here in verse 15 of Second Peter chapter 3, he said, an account that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, uh, according, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also he, I'm sorry, in all his epistles, speaking in them of, thing, of, of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they, now look at this, that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other Scriptures under their own destruction. There are those that literally wrestle with the Scripture. They, li they li literally struggle and wrestle with the Scripture, and you know them. You've got them in your family. You, you've got them on the job sites. You know that the, they struggle and wrestle and, and with the Scripture, and it's to their own destruction because it drives them farther away from God as as Satan came into the garden and he began putting doubts in Eve's mind of the Word of God and it brought the fall of man. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples of this. And one of these, and I'll tell you what, let's turn to this one. James chapter 2 and Romans chapter 4. Let me give you a few just the simple ones. And if we can find an answer to just a few of these, then I believe there's a great possibility that we could find an answer to all the supposed discrepancy in the Word of God. And there's men that have actually written books on this and, you know, and uh, have studied this extensively. Now, James chapter 2 and Romans chapter 4, these are going to be the first passage uh, that we're going to look at. Now, notice in James chapter 2, and now what I'm going to do for time's sake, let me take one verse. In James chapter 2, we have verse 24. 
He says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now turn with me please to Romans chapter 4. Now Martin Luther the Reformer had problems with the book of James because of what it says in the book of Romans. There seems to be a contradiction here. Both James and Paul use Abraham to illustrate the truth about justification. Both of them. And when we look at this closely, we'll see that Romans is dealing with our justification before God. Vertical. And James is dealing with our justification before men, that which is horizontal. God sees clearly the hearts of men, but you and I can't not see the hearts. We see the works or the fruit. So genuine salvation bears fruit. Genuine salvation will work. Now notice in Romans chapter 4, and he's talking about Abraham in verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pretending the flesh have found? What did Abraham find out? Verse 2, for Abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. See that? For what saith the Scriptures, Abraham believed God, and counted him unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. There's many today that still cannot have any kind of reconciliation between the book of Romans and the book of James. You take one of the reformers that translated the German Bible that struggled between... He came out of Catholicism, which is totally a, a, a works-based you know, religion, and he's accepted Christ as faith and whatever, and then he's reading over here in James, and he's saying, this just can't be. And he had some pretty strong words to say about the book of James. And you and I believe that there is no contradictions in the Word of God. And so we must reconcile the two passages together. And I was in an organization, uh, the Grace Brethren or the Bereans, many, many years ago. And one of the struggles that we ha I had with them, I was in a conference of about probably a total of 20, 25 preachers that we were loosely associated with. And one of the things is that when I tried to deal with the book of James, they would say, and, and I've even said this myself at one time, they would say, well, the book of James is not for us today, it's for that Jew. You know, see, look at it, read it closely for the Jew during a, a future time. And that, you know, that that's, you know, trying to, they call it rightly, dividing the word of truth, and really it's wrongly dividing the word of truth. And see, that was their way of getting around it. I fell into that trap for a while. Their way of getting around it is saying, these two don't fit, so Paul's writing to the Gentiles and James writing to the Jews, and, and you know, this is just different situations and whatever, different time periods and, and those kind of things. And one is the gospel of the grace, the other is the gospel of the kingdom, uh, you know, and whatever. One has to do with the church and the other one has to do with Israel. And, and so that was their division, you see, of this. And again, I was involved in that with, for a number of years and kept questioning John chapter 3 and James chapter 2. And I said, we can't throw these passages away. They must be reconciled. And the way to reconcile them, is, again, is that Romans is leaning more toward Abraham's justification in the sight of God and James is leaning more toward our justification in the sight of men and just showing that there is fruit, there is works that are associated with our faith and so forth. We're not saved by our works, but as I said this morning, works will follow. We don't get into heaven by good works, but good works will follow us into heaven. That's what Romans chapter 14 says. Now let's look at one other one here. Now turn with me to Numbers chapter 25. In the book of Numbers, in chapter 25, and 1 Corinthians 8. Now, I do have an article on this, and I think 
These are in the article, so you could get that and look at it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, and Numbers 25, and we're going to be reading in verse 9. Now, here's what I'm doing. I'm taking only a few. I'm giving you four. Now, we're only going to read two. I'm going to just give you the references to the other. And, and if we can take three, four, five, maybe six, and we can find the supposed discrepancies to be a lie, then what about all the others? Is there a possibility that there is, that there are no discrepancies in the King James Bible? You see what I'm getting at? Now, the others, I'll just go ahead and give you the others. In Genesis 15, verse 13, Exodus 12, verse 40, in Acts 7, 6, dealing with the length of the Egyptian bondage. One passage says 400 years in affliction. And another passage speaks of 430 years that they, when they came out of bondage. You say, what is the answer? Well, they're in affliction 400 years, but the total bondage that they were down in Egypt was 430 years. The first 30 years, they weren't in affliction. Joseph was alive uh, you know, for a long time, and they had a relation. I mean, Joseph took care of his brethren, his father and his brethren, when they came down. They weren't under afflictions when they first went into Egypt, but after Joseph's death. So there's no discrepancy there. I was reading some more material this week and, and some of the different avenues that people go with that good people, and I'm thinking, I don't think it's that complicated. And they're saying, well, they couldn't have been in Egypt 400 years. They had to include the land of Canaan. And I said, well, let me just at least consider that. I can't compute that. I have to go back to just simple facts. They were in affliction 400 years. They were in bondage 430 years. And they came out on the very exact day that God said they would come out. There's no discrepancy here. I'll give you another one. Write these two verses down. 2 Samuel 6.23 and 2 Samuel 21.8. Now listen to this. One verse speaks of the five sons of Michael, David's wife. And the other verse says that she had no child. Both statements are correct. You say, now you've done lost it now. She raised her sister's sons. In other words, it actually says in 2 Samuel 21.8, she brought up. She had raised her sister's sons. And, 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 and there's no discrepancy there. But again, folks will come along and say, you've got contradictions, you've got errors, you've got mistakes. There's ages and dates and everything else that just don't fit and don't line up. Now let me give you an example here. We're going to read this, read one of the verse we're going to close. But notice in 1 Corinthians, I'll read there first. In 1 Corinthians... Chapter 10 and verse 8, and it says, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day twenty and three, I'm sorry, in one day three and twenty thousand. That's twenty three thousand that fell in one day. Now notice in Numbers 25, this is the text that he's referring back to. And notice carefully as we come here. See, 1 Corinthians 10.8 says 23,000 people fell. But the Bible says here in chapter 25 and in verse 9, and those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. Now see, there's many in our society today. And this brother uh, we were talking about a moment ago probably would run this route. There's many in our society today say, well, see there? Told you the Bible had mistakes in it. One verse says there were 23,000. I mean, that's quite a large number there. You know, one says 23,000, the other says 24,000. And see, they'll use things like that to discredit the Word of God. Or, as Satan did when he came into the garden, they'll use these things to put doubts in our minds. And if they ever get us doubting this book, we're through. It's over. Because you have no foundation, you have no anchor for the soul, you have nothing, because we can say, well, I got the Spirit. We didn't know we had the Spirit unless we read it in the book. You can say, you can say, well, you know, we got the creation. We didn't know we had the creation until God said it. 
He told us the heavens declare the glory of God. I mean, everything we have comes right back to this. Now, the answer again here, I think, is, is quite simple. There's no error between the two passages. Now, here's what I believe, and I believe this makes sense. Um, you'll notice that in verse 20, I'm sorry, 25 verse 9, and those that died in the plague. Now, God plagued them because of their whoredom with the daughters of Moab in verse 1 and 2. They, they, uh, Balaam taught Balak how to get his, God's people into immorality. And so, they use the women uh, of Moab, and then they come to their sacrifices in verse 2, and they join themselves in verse 3 to Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and He plagued them. So in verse 25, verse 9, chapter 25, verse 9, it says, those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. I believe that's exactly correct. There are 24,000 that died total in this plague. They were 23,000 that died in one day. Obviously, this went more than one day. And let me just add one more thing to it. Come with me to verse 4. You see, the plague obviously lasted longer than one day in which the total of 24,000 died. Now, but notice in verse 4, we, I think we have the others he said in verse 4, and the Lord said unto Moses, take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And so here's a necktie party. We have a, probably a thousand leaders. Here, he said, you know, we have here, they were probably hanged by the judges and there are 23,000 that fell in the plague in one day, but here, 1,000, they are probably hanged by the judges themselves. So, there is no discrepancy. And again, if we've got answers for just a few of these, like Romans and James, and, and here in this passage in 1 Corinthians, then obviously, if a person spent the time on the other supposed discrepancies, they could probably, may take them a few years, but they could probably find the answers in the Word of God. Instead of coming to it, doubting it, saying, God, Your Word is true, and so I ask You to teach me and show me what the answer to this is. Now, we'll close in Revelation 22 with this series. In Revelation 22, we've read this uh, three or four times this year. In Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. I've said for years, if I don't accomplish anything else in this church, I want, to, I want to accomplish the fact that to convince you that you have God's eternal, holy, and precious Word you know, in your presence. And we read here in verse 18 and 19, and he said, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I'd be very afraid. I'd be very fearful to look at someone and say, there's errors in that book. I would, I'd just be very afraid to do that. This is God's holy word. And we'll end the series at this time.